Um, when we came back from seminary, we uh, eventually moved into a house. And uh, once we got settled in, my kids started asking for a pet. Now, I had grown up in a Chinese home where we had no pets, okay? If we brought a dog home, my mom was just as likely to eat it. So, but she had no use for dogs or animals. You know, they were work, they were money, you know, and no contribution. But my kids wanted a pet. So I thought, all right, we got to start small. So we went looking for a gerbil. We found a gerbil. And, you know, for me, as well as for my kids, it would be our first pet. So I was excited, but I wouldn't let it show, right? I got to be the dad. So when we're picking out the gerbil, I thought, we want one that's going to be fun. So we looked and tried to find the most active gerbil in the whole batch. And so we brought that gerbil home. And my kids named it Jiffy, Jiffy the gerbil. Okay? And we were so excited. We bought the cage, we bought the tunnel, we brought the little ball so it can run around all over the house, you know, pushing the ball from the inside. Well, first time we brought that gerbil out, that little sucker bit me right on the finger. <laughs> okay? You know, gerbils have very, very tiny but sharp teeth. And it stung. It really stung left these two little holes in there, you know, on the sensitive part of your finger pad. And then after that, i try again and again, and Jiffy would bite me every time. Well, of course, I couldn't let the kids handle Jiffy. So pretty soon, I says, hey, we have an American saying, Jiffy, you don't bite the hand that feeds you. <laughs> so, Jiffy, couldn't get it. So eventually, we abandoned Jiffy to his or her cage. I forgot if it was a boy gerbil or girl gerbil. Maybe there's no difference. Anyway, so we just gave up for it. We decided this was a neurotic gerbil, and we're not going to bother with it. Well, this is kind of an illustration about how much better God is than us. Okay? how much better God is from us. And we're going to continue now in our series on the atonement of Christ. And what I want is that, that we put up the passage for this morning, Colossians 1, 19 to 23. It's one of three great main passages about the topic of reconciliation. And I'm going to read it and what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in a proper pronoun instead of just a general pronoun so that it becomes clear for you to understand. And I'm also going to point out some of the key words and phrases that we're going to come back to during the process of the sermon. Okay? So I want you to follow along and just see what I'm highlighting. For in him, Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Jesus, to reconcile to God all things, whether on earth, note that, or in heaven, and then note, making peace by the what? By the blood of his cross. So we've heard the word reconcile, we've heard the word making peace. We've seen what it took, the blood of the cross, and we're talking about God reconciling not just us, but all things in heaven and on earth. Verse 21, and you, meaning us, who once were alienated and hostile in mind and doing evil deeds, you notice these three that are listed, Jesus has now reconciled in his own body of flesh again, in his body of flesh, by his death. In order to present you, meaning us, again, a triple, holy and blameless and above reproach before God. 
And then finally, verse 23, and I want you to notice the if. If, indeed, you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. All right, so that's the whole passage, and I wanted to present it that way because unlike a lot of other times where I might go verse by verse, or sometimes I give you a formal topical outline, or sometimes um, uh, just preach on a main theme, uh, this one, we're going to be a combination of many, many kinds of methods of presenting a message. Now, to catch us back up, we just finished the fourth of the suffering servant songs in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah. And the reason we were looking at that was because people around the cross, they had many ideas about what was going on when Jesus died. And a lot of those were wrong. Some of those were wrong and right. And so we said the only way to really know for sure is to go back to the one who planned it all. And so we went back to Isaiah. And when God planned it, he shared with us what the cross was all about. That his son would come as a suffering servant. And he would go through excruciating process of offering himself in exchange for us. And we saw how this prophecy is so amazing to get so many details that were unimaginable 700 years before Jesus came and went through what he did. And this becomes our foundation for going through this series on the atonement. All right, and so today you see we are shifting from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We're going to now look backward so that those who had gone through the experience now can look back at the Old Testament, look at what actually happened, and from that, after some time of thinking about it, get a clear idea of what it all meant. Not just what happened, but all that it meant. And today, I want to take us to the heart of understanding the meaning of the cross to the very heart and soul and center of what the cross is all about. And it is in the word reconciliation. Reconciliation, this is special. It stands out, and as I say, I believe it's at the heart of salvation among all the benefits of salvation. And the sad thing I feel is I don't think it's valued enough. It somehow seems to get very little notice, and I'm going to talk about why we should give it special notice. And let me just kind of give you a little hint. When you think of things like forgiveness, redemption, justification, sonship, which are some of those benefits of salvation, they mostly have to do with our benefit. This one, instead of being unilateral to man, is bilateral. It involves God. There is a payoff for him, so to speak. And so this is what makes it kind of different, makes it stand out. All right? So let me give you the first of our four points. One, relationship is at the very heart of salvation. And that's why the topic of reconciliation is so special. When we studied Isaiah 52, and it told us about the monumental effort of God to provide salvation for man, did you ever get that sense? You know, I think God overpaid. Right? It's like me with Jiffy. You bite me five times, you're out of here. <laughs> God seems like he overpaid for our salvation. 
And yet he did it. And the question should be, why? Why did he even bother? Why didn't God just start all over with a new set of humans? He's done that before. Some of you may have gone to see the movie Noah. I did not. Everything at my age has to be with subtitles by DVD. Okay? Um, anyway, God destroyed mankind. And he says, Jiffy, you're out of here. Start all over. But God, starting with Noah, started bringing a whole new word into the Bible vocabulary. The word is covenant. And suddenly, it comes up over and over in the story of Noah. And covenant is different from contract, okay? The closest thing I can think of modern day in covenant is the marriage contract. I have thought of starting this sermon and asking you to think, what's the biggest contract any of you have gone into? And some of you would have said, my cell phone contract. <laughs> okay? Others would have said, my first car. Others would have said house. And I wanted to see who would think of their marriage contract as the most important contract that they had ever gone into. Um, anyway, so it's kind of like that. Well, God did not decide to start over because of covenant. And again, God is so different from man. You know, Every Christmas, one of the most popular gifts brought to the home are what? Fruitcake. Fruitcake. <laughs> All right, Mark, you've got to sing again. Um, puppies, right? And what happens to so many puppies after a few days? Kids lose interest. Parents run out of time and the puppies go back to the animal shelter. You know, that's the way man handles things, but not so God. He sticks with us. First Peter 1.12 says, it's amazing to the angels how God would persevere with man, stick with that covenant relationship, and go through all that he goes through. And again, the question is, why? And so he sets up a covenant. And it's kind of introduced with Noah, but the next Bible character in Genesis is Abraham. Abraham steps on the scene on chapter 12, and after he goes through some preliminary dating relationship with God, so to speak, in chapter 15, something very dramatic happens. God says, I'm going to make a formal covenant with you, Abraham. And he puts him into a sleep, and he gives him a dream. And in it, he pictures how covenants are formed. Now, covenants were very well-known stuff back in the ancient Near East, all right? In those times, the usual covenant was between an emperor and a king. And the emperor would say, I will protect you, and I'm going to make sure that your kingdom survives. But in order to do that, you've got to show your loyalty to me. And so uh, it was a well-known thing. But here's the thing about covenants. You know how in the movies and in some customs, some groups of people, when you make a deal, we, we shake our hands, right? Um, they cut their fingers and they join the blood and they do all that kind of stuff, okay? Or, or they send the daughter over to be married to the prince in the other kingdom, kind of a benign hostage, <laughs> okay? What they did in those days is they would take an animal and they would lay the animal down and they would say, kill the animal, cut it in two. And the idea of that piece 
of the ceremony was this covenant is a life and death matter. And we're not messing around. You say, you're going to get into this covenant, you better mean business. And if I don't fulfill my terms of the covenant, may what happen to this animal happen to me. Okay? Serious stuff. You don't want to go around making these things until you've thought about it at least overnight. Well, God did the same thing with Abraham in Genesis 15, but he did a virtual version by giving him a dream about them doing this together. And Abraham wakes up and he buys into it. And so when man sins, God comes to the rescue. Because we, as Abraham's spiritual children, God comes to the rescue. All right? And so we're part of that covenant. But what is amazing about this thing is, usually if somebody breaks the covenant, who should apologize? The covenant breaker. Who should make amends? The covenant breaker. But in this case, who was the one who went to the effort to make the amends and to get things right? The offended party, God. You following? This is deep theology, okay? This is the kind of stuff that you have to pay a lot of money into seminary for. I've given it to you for free, okay? Uh, anyway, so that's a joke. Um, anyway, and so God seeks to reconcile us, and he does it without regard to the cost of the price because relationship is so important to God. And he gives us the word reconciliation. And reconciliation is the New Testament equivalent of the word in the Old Testament, atonement. Okay? And so he gives us reconciliation as one of the outcomes of the cross. And there's a real bundle, all right? It's like AT&T. You get a bundled. And we get this bundle of benefits with the cross. And so you think about it. This is why God, he made the covenant and he will honor it. And who is the animal? Who is the life that is given? Jesus. Whoa. Whoa. The offended party does what the offending party should have done. That is something. And so God takes this treaty so seriously and he maintains the relationship. <clears throat> Number two, I want to talk about how reconciliation stands out among salvation's benefits. And let me give you a kind of a sense of the progression of the benefits of salvation. Forgiveness. That's probably the most popular one. To me, forgiveness is kind of like going, whew, I got out of that one easy. You know? Um, and certainly, it's good. It gives us some sense of relief. Okay? Then, we have deliverance by redemption. As we say, we are set free. And we are mostly set free from sin and from guilt. Have you ever done something really bad and the person you did it to says, don't worry about it, but you went away stealing, feeling like a schmuck? Huh? That's a good Old Testament word, schmuck. Okay? Uh, you still feel guilty about it, right? And you need to be set free. Some of you guys got to realize that's not really an Old Testament word. All right, I just threw that in. Um, okay, so that's deliverance. And it gives us a little deeper relief. Then we come to justification of righteousness. Okay, and this makes us really feel good about ourselves. We feel noble. And we become justified and righteous. And it's like, guys, if we got to play on the same team with Michael Jordan and... Um, 
Bill Russell at the same time. Okay? You can't lose with that combination, right? That's kind of like the next step. Then we get sonship. Wow, I get to be a part of the family. But here's the catch. Here is why reconciliation is still so important. Do you realize that children of rich parents often are the ones who hate their parents the most? There's a book that came out last year by this Canadian investment counselor. Let me read to you the title. It's called The Great White Elephant, Why Rich Kids Hate Their Families. (laughs) That sounds pretty depressing, right? Well, what they found out was the reason was the lack of emotional relationship, a lack of resolving emotional needs and relationship issues that aren't dealt with when they come up. And because they're not dealt with, the kids get very angry and become rebellious, and they continue to push the boundary, looking for that attention that they're not getting. They don't have the warmth of family love. You can have a perfectly fine functioning family, well-fed, house looks neat, the kids go away to college and get a degree and get a good job, but if there isn't that warmth of relationship, it does not matter. Because we are built to relate and to love. That's why there is a trinity in which they love one another, support one another, and work together in harmony. And this is part of how we reflect God. And that's why even to be a son of God, if you don't feel that love for God, and I think a lot of Christians, God's going to let into heaven, but at that time, they're going to have to begin to really learn to emotionally love God. A lot of us, we have made the decision because we need the forgiveness but we haven't let it flower into that kind of loving relationship of complete, full trust. And we want to get to that point. Ever since Genesis 2, God has had people who walk with him and were called his friends. And you know that those were special delights to God. And so this is so important. And Colossians 1.19 says, the fullness of God was in Christ to pay the price through the blood of the cross, verse 20, and by the flesh of his death. Third point, between God and man, sin has always been about relationship and trust and love. Remember the first Sin. What was the first sin? In the garden. The The taking of a fruit. Now, I studied a little criminal law. I practiced a little criminal law. There are felonies. What's next? Misdemeanors. Misdemeanors. (laughs) Infractions, Mark. Infractions. Okay. In fractions, you don't even get a jury. You don't get a public defender. They are so minor. What do you think taking a fruit would be considered? You think it's a felony? Do you think that Adam had to kill anybody to get to that tree? No. Okay? It was probably practically a technical violation. Nothing evil except one vital thing. There was a breach of trust. A doubt of love and welfare by Adam, of God. The relationship experienced a wrinkle and a break. You see? So ever since that first sin, Well, after that, the whole thing came tumbling down. 
like they show in those commercials. That guy grabs a can from the stack of cans, and he thinks he's picked the right one, and next thing you know, one can, two cans, and then the whole thing falls down. And God says, that's what happened. Now the whole creation groans because of what Adam did. And that's why Colossians 1 says, God had to reconcile everything to himself. All things, it said, heaven and on earth. You see, he had no idea when he started. Sin is very personal. It isn't a violation of some rules. We, we, we tend to think that way because the American system, we think, oh man, you know, I was going five million miles over the speed limit, but that's only because some guy who doesn't drive on the street thinks that 40 miles an hour is the maximum that's safe. And we think it's a violation against some rule, but with God, it's a very personal thing. When David sinned and he committed adultery and he finally got his head right and his heart right, what did he say to God in Psalm 51? He says, Against you I have sinned, only you. Psalm 51. <clears throat> Psalm 59, too, says, Your sins have hidden you from God. And that's what happens. So it's very, very personal. And that was the third point. And so we come to our last point, number four. So our sin issues must be addressed and not ignored despite the pain and the cost. And it says that God would give of his body and his blood. Man's method of dealing with problems. Animosity is what? The Asian way is what? We don't talk about it, right? You know what happens when we don't work it out? Eventually, we have drift. And that drift eventually leads to alienation. Okay? And if that alienation, with a little misunderstanding and a little self-defensiveness, can become hostility. Even if we don't go all the way, a great Asian way of dealing with it is to be passive-aggressive. Right? We become insubordinate, we become indifferent. We become too busy for God. Colossians 1.21 says, you were hostile in your mind before you did your evil deeds. That's passive aggressiveness. Hostile in our minds. And so this is how we handle it. How does God handle it? Luke 15, the prodigal son's father. Hates the sin, but loves and waits. An entirely different thing until the sinner comes back. Romans 5, 6, and 8 says, While we were still weak, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Professor name of Addison Leach tells this story of what happened to him. He would be up in his attic preparing his lectures <clears throat> for, for his classes. And it was a nice place to be because right outside of his window in the attic was this nice tree that gave him shade and gave him beauty. And underneath, uh, because of the tra uh, tree and the shade, a lot of the neighborhood kids would often come to play. So he'd hear the mirth of their song, I mean, their, their play and their games and stuff like that. So he enjoyed it. And eventually he got to know the kids and he became friends with the kids. Sometimes he would take things out to the kids so that, you know, their fun could be even better. Well, one day he heard them while he was up there and there was a lot of excitement coming from the kids. And so he looked out and he noticed one of the kids had just gotten a new gift and he was showing it off. Guess what it was? A BB gun. A daisy air rifle. You guys still know what a BB gun is? Okay. 
I never know how old I am. Anyway, so he's watching them, and the kid said, let me touch it, let me feel it. And finally, the owner of the kid seemed to spot something in the tree. Well, it was a bird. So he wanted to impress his friends. So raises the air rifle to show what he can do. And Addison Leach says, oh, I saw that and I knew what could happen next and I started to worry. Sure enough, the kid shot the BB gun, missed the bird, but guess what he did hit? The window. Crash comes the window. Boom goes the kids. They all go running away. Well, Addison says, well, I eventually fixed the window, put it all together, put it behind me. But I started to notice something. Day after day, when the kids gathered under my tree, that little boy who owned the BB gun and shot it did not come to play. And he realized what had happened. This boy's fear and his guilt had gotten the better of him. And so even though he wanted to be with his friends, he could not feel safe and proper. So Addison says, so I then decided to go to find him. And so he found where the kid lived, found him in the yard, went up to him, and took hold of him before he could turn and run. And he says, I have to tell you, you've got to believe me. It's okay. I've fixed the window. I've cleaned up the mess. I've paid the bill. You don't have to worry about anything. I want you back with the kids at the house. And it took him a while before the boy, bing, got it. That's reconciliation. We could not make things right. But God pursues, as C.S. Lewis says, like the hound of heaven to bring us back, convincing us that it's okay. That we, it says, don't have to be alienated, hostile in mind, and doing evil deeds. But now we are considered holy, blameless, and above reproach. Wow, I'd love it if somebody said that to me. <laughs> Holy, blameless, and above reproach? No way. But this is the way God looks at us. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Let me quickly give you four applications before we have our communion service, all right? So all my communion helpers, time to get on your coats. <laughs> um, first one is this. We have to realize that sin is personal to God. It's not just some abstraction. It's not just some violation of some rule. All right? It is something that hurts him and causes him great grief. It's not just about us. Number two, we have to realize what it says in verse 23. If we continue in the faith, we need to continue in the faith. And it's maybe up and maybe down. But somewhere along the line, we need to always get back to God. We need to continue in the faith. Otherwise, it will expose the fact that we really did not have faith. We had church, we had Christian parents, but we did not have faith. Okay? Number three. God went to all this to bring about reconciliation. He made the effort, and he, even though he was the offended party, did what was necessary. In Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you know, if somebody has something against you, before you offer your offering at the altar, Go and make reconciliation. We have people in our lives, family members, friends, co-workers, especially bosses and supervisors, okay? Sometimes neighbors. Go make reconciliation. And fourth and final, 
1 Corinthians 15, we read it at the beginning of the service. God has given us the joy of presenting this message of his love to others. We should be ambassadors of reconciliation. And that's why I challenge us to think about people to invite for Easter service. All right? Now let's go ahead and prepare our hearts for our communion service.